Hello. Hello. Welcome to the Alice and Co. Patterns contribution to the online sewing weekender. I hope you're enjoying your sewing wherever you are in the world. Um, one of the fun things about doing Zoom classes during lockdown is meeting all sorts of people from all over the place who we wouldn't otherwise have met. Um, for our contribution um, to this weekend, we are going to do a little bit of pattern cutting based on um, historical patterns. But first of all, before we get going with that, let's just um, introduce ourselves to you. Um, I'm Alice and there's my daughter Lilia in, in the other box, Hello. usually with me, but uh, in her own, her own studio today. Um, and between us, we are Alice and Co. Patterns and we make um, PDF patterns that people can download at home to make their own styles. Um, I'm a self-taught pattern cutter, but I love cutting patterns actually much more than I like sewing them up. Um, but my, my background is not, I'm not trained in pattern cutting. I trained as a theatre designer and worked in the theatre making costumes. So making historical patterns is almost coming around full circle. Um, but I've had a, a business for a long time um, doing made to measure clothes, women's clothes, which of course I can't do at the moment. And I've also been doing a lot of teaching um, pattern cutting usually at lovely Ray Stitch in uh, Islington in London and I'm going to let Lilia introduce herself before we move on and uh, show you our ideas for the day. Uh, yes, so I'm Lilia um, and I usually work at the V&A Museum in London um, in the textile conservation department um, and I do something called costume mounting, which means that I prepare all of the mannequins for display whenever um, we're putting on a fashion exhibition or any costume or textiles across the whole museum, um, they come through our department. So I get to handle lots of um, lovely old things, um, which I'm missing at the moment, but enjoying having time to invent these online classes, uh, which we're gonna give you a bit of a taste of today, um, but also combining um, our historical interest as well. Great. I remember the, when Lilia first started at her job, she came home very excitedly when she was working on the um, Hollywood exhibition and said, guess not what, Mum? I was working on Charlie Chaplin's trousers today. <laughs> and I think actually Charlie Chaplin's baggy trousers have something to do with what we're actually going to be talking about today. So maybe That's true. Not. Smooth segue. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, shall we start? So um, we have, we were thinking that it would be fun to look back a hundred years and see what was happening a um, hundred years ago. Um, so we've picked for our, our designer, um, Paul Poiret, because he really exemplifies a change from the kind of old style where women were very corseted and um, very kind of shaped by whale bones and, and padding um, rather than allowed to be their own natural shape and have natural movement. And there were other designers also working um, in this kind of field to liberate women, but Paul Poiré was one of the main um, instigators. And also he was um, very, very interested in, in theater costumes as well. So that kind of um, ties in nicely with our own interests. Uh, so Lilia, do you want to just say a little bit about a little bit about Paul Poiré and tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, so if I share my screen. Okay, so this is the man we're talking about on the left here. This is Paul Poiré um, and he was born in Paris in 1879 um, and he was born into a family that worked in textiles but um, it was a working class family and he was sent off at a young age to become an apprentice in an umbrella factory actually and he has anecdotes about saving all the scraps from the um, umbrellas and making designs for a doll for his sister. So he was obviously someone that grew up around textiles um, and not someone who came from a background that you would necessarily think would rise to the kind of social heights that he did and become so influential in um, 20th century fashion. Um, but he did. Uh, he also had a um, quick demise after the war as well. But we won't go into that right now. What we'll focus on is um, his design style and the influence that it had. Um, so on the right is a really charming illustration of some Poiré designs. And this was the kind of first inspiration 
for this talk actually because we were just so charmed by these illustrations weren't we yes i think there's um all sorts of lovely things about them um, one is that they're a rather departure from there were sorts of sort of pen and ink black and white very fussy drawings of um, ladies wearing lots of frills and furbelows and these have a very sort of charming simplicity about them and the, the colors are lovely and the actual style of the drawings um, is very charming as well as the clothes that they depict and I think there's um, if you go through them they're quite interesting as to what they are actually showing so this lady here i mean she could be a lady in lockdown walk, watering her garden um, but at this time orientalism was all the rage and um, artists in particular were very excited by um, things and uh, articles from the east and in kimonos and in um, kind of uh, costume from the east and this lady here she's got a hat on a nice hat that could be vietnamese or um, Japanese and watering her, her garden. Um, this one I think is, is rather important because here she's playing tennis and obviously women were just beginning to enjoy sport um, but they had to do it bundled up in their corsets and their big long heavy skirts. So this idea that the woman can actually jump in her, in her jumpsuit, um, it might be two pieces or it might be all in one but it certainly looks like a jumpsuit that you could play tennis in today um, and there's a lovely kind of lightness and freedom of movement in it which there certainly was, weren't in uh, the first clothes that women were expected to play tennis in. Um, this lady down here has a rather curious kind of um, like a, a a long skirt or a corset almost on top of her outfit. I think this is to make it demure because any kind of hint of crotch um, and two legs joining together at the top was, was still very risque. She looks a little bit coy there with, with her rose, um, but the colours are interesting. Um, and then this one I just absolutely love. I think it's such a lovely outfit. I could jump into that right now. And it looks like it could be made with some lovely, luscious, um, maybe silk or rayon velvet, perhaps with some fur around it. And just everything about it is lovely. I'd like to have that little hat. Um, and she's got a fan in her hand, which again was very much used in paintings of the time. Um, lots of uh, Manet and Monet, uh, pictures Renoir had ladies with fans again kind of nod to the um, to the Orient and the textiles and um, artifacts that people were beginning to be able to buy in in the West. Yeah so um, to kind of show you just how revolutionary these types of designs are we can look back at um, the style so we're kind of cheating a little bit by saying that we're doing 19 20s because Poirier was really um, at his height of um, kind of revolutionizing fashion in the 1910s and then obviously there was the war and then when he came back after the war he um, kind of other designers were starting to come through like Chanel and kind of taking over from him so the yeah. 1910s is really his moment so if we're looking at 1920 as that fashion moment where things changed um, this Can is... I just butt in there, Lilia? He did go back after the war. He wanted to resume his career and he went back to the House of Worth. And the House of Worth, if um, it's not familiar to you, was actually um, Charles Worth, who was an English designer. And he went, he lived in Paris and actually started the Paris Couture Houses. And you can see from his styles that everything was very fussy. Um, and when he went back after the First World War, that the, the, the um, to resume his place, they did not like in one little bit what he was doing and considered him quite an enfant terrible for um, introducing such shocking um, styles. Mm. Yeah, so these are, these are looking, these fashion plates on the left are showing you the style that was fashionable at the turn of the century, so around eight, 1900. Um, and you can see that they're characterized by this really extreme um, S-bend corset, which there's also a picture of on the right. Um, and it gives you this kind of very uh, exaggerated like pigeon chest with the very curvaceous um, derriere coming out the, um, at the back and very, very tiny waist. Um, and this is all these curves are accentuated by this kind of uh, panelled gourd skirts at the hem. Um, lots of frills, lace, kind of 
very um, decorated, lots of details and then covered right from the neck um, down to the floor, but also um, very shapely and shaped to this very um, heavily corseted shape. Um, and here's a pattern because we do really want to um, kind of show you the fashion history from the pattern cutters perspective is the idea behind these talks and to uh, show you what the construction behind these garments. So this is the type of construction for the type of skirt that we just showed you. Um, and you can see how complicated it is with lots of different panels and um, gauze and lots of different sections. Um, and that's because it was designed, it's kind of fashion designed to sculpt around that heavily corseted shape. So when we get to Poiret, this is Poiret at work, his is a completely different approach to um, pattern cutting. And it's really the, the start of what we call draping. I mean, he by no means invented this, and I'm sure that lots of drape, dressmakers did drape over corseted figures, but the difference here is that he is draping onto, directly onto the um, female body. Um, and the picture on the right is actually his wife, uh, Denise Poiret, and he said that his wife was the inspiration for all his creations and the expression of all my ideas. Um, and she's really credited with changing the fashionable shape for women because all throughout history, um, fashionable clothing also dictates um, fashionable body shapes. So these things are completely intertwined. Um, and I was lucky enough to work um, on the underwear exhibition at the V&A, if anyone saw that, which really showed you just how extreme uh, the shapes changed, especially in the um, 19th century, just every 10 years, the corset shapes kind of fluctuated in and out. Um, so doing away with the corset here was, it's hard to explain how revolutionary that would have been and how that would have felt to women at the time because your, your corset was um, it was like a, a sign of um, your sign of how fashionable you are but also a sign of decency it was kind of the if the last thing that a woman would sell if she was kind of falling into disrepute would be her corset um, so just kind of a note of how scandalous this might be um, and showing you that instead Poiret is really looking at this um, kind of column shape. So seeing the body, uh, he, he, there's a lovely quote about him wanting the fabric to fall from the shoulders to the floor and kind of pull at the bottom. And you can really see that in these designs that he's created here. Um, also very inspired by antiquity and um, kind of Grecian statues. And you can imagine those types of drapery there. Do you want to add anything here? Well, I was just going to say something about the fabrics, that if you think that time, there were actually quite a lot of new things going on in the actual fabrics themselves. So there were beginning to be some interesting um, man-made fa fabrics, although they weren't petrol-based fabrics like polyesters, but they were more um, the viscous and um, artificial silk, which is we also called rayon, and those kind of fabrics, which have a different fall, ev even from silk. Um, and I think, again, those um, sort of uh, Edwardian fabrics and earlier fabrics were all natural. They were quite stiff, you know, they ironed them, they had a kind of solidity to them. Um, whereas if you think of the lovely drape of a piece of heavy viscous, and there were also new kind of designs. There were, you know, jazz age designs, lots more abstract designs, new colors even, because there were new kind of artificial dyes. So um, a bit like when nylon came in in the 60s, although we kind of poo poo it now as being artificial at the time, all these new things were, were very exciting and they were, they were very new. Um, and also textiles have always been very important in France um, and employed a lot of people. So um, this was, a um, kind of exciting way to show off. There were designs with aeroplanes on, um, designs kind of based on speed, um, sort, of sort of art deco designs. So everything was exciting, I think, and they needed a new way. You couldn't really have put um, a piece of fabric with aeroplanes on it onto one of those um, gourd skirts, for example, partly because it would have looked silly and also you wouldn't want to cut up the, um, the bold design. So this slide is showing you a few more examples of uh, Poiret's work. So this one on the left is from the V&A collection and there's really amazing piece. It's actually just two rectangles 
which are um, draped together over the shoulders and held at either side. So on one side with this big decorative bow, which you can see is um, kind of the fabric is draping underneath it. And this one is really, I think this one is in the kimonos exhibition, if anyone got a chance to see it um, before lockdown happened. I think there's a video on the VNA website at the moment, so you can uh, see inside the exhibition as well. Um, so this is showing you the types of cutting that he was inspired by. And if you think back to those corseted shapes that we looked earlier, just how different this is in terms of the body. The, the body is completely lost within the drapes of the fabric and it's all just about these two pieces um, intersecting. So this is actually a coat, but I mean, you could imagine wearing this as a dress today. And I think in this um, talk and everything we're doing, we're not trying to be re reconstructing or doing historical costuming in that sense, but really it's about how to take inspiration from historical pieces and their construction um, and then um, shamelessly wear them in a modern way. <laughs> And then on the right here, we have an illustration for uh, actually for a fancy dress costume for his wife, Denise. Um, and the reason why we wanted to show you this illustration is because the practical demonstration we're going to do is going to be looking at trousers. And Poiré was one of the first designers to introduce trousers into women's wear, which again was another kind of revolutionary idea. That's um, interesting that this one is a fancy dress costume because at the time I think wearing trousers was quite avant-garde, although I think later on we've got a slide of um, trousers also being as for women working um, in, in the war, but we can talk a little bit more about that when we come to the slide. Um, but wearing a fancy dress costume like this obviously gave you a little bit of leeway to wear things that might ordinarily be considered too shocking. But mostly these kind of parties were held in people's private homes. So if you were lucky, your, your private home was a stately one and you could throw big lavish parties um, and um, everybody would, would dress up and wear um, quite costumes that might be considered too shocking to wear um, out in public, but in amongst um, friends and um, high society were perfectly acceptable. And here's an example of the uh, actual design, which we just showed you the illustration for. So this is in the Met collection. And this one's just a lovely picture of a turban that we couldn't resist, but partly because um, Poiré did actually study turbans in the VNA. He made a great big study of them. He loved them. But I think we're all um, reinventing the turban for our, our lockdown um, uh, hair at the moment. <laughs> okay, so here are some examples of Poiré's models uh, wearing this type of very loose, billowy trouser, which is inspired by designs he had seen from Eastern fashions. And this one here looks like the lady in the illustration with the green and pink. She's got this strange kind of long see-through skirt almost over the top of her trousers. And I think this lady has two, although it's a bit harder to see here whether it's actually joined up or whether this is a separate, almost like a tunic on top. So again, just wanting you to remember how different this silhouette is from those pictures we showed you at the beginning um, and how it's all about the draping of the fabric. Um, and it's kind of interesting that in one hand it's this uh, revolutionary new garment, women getting to wear trousers, finally freeing their legs, um, but it's still very much within the silhouette of a skirt and there's still lots and lots of fabric which is hiding the actual shape of the body and um, that scandalous crotch <laughs> area. So I think what we're trying to show you here by uh, juxtaposing this workwear with the very elegant um, kind of high fashion Poirot designs is to show you what's happening in the home sewing industry um, and also in the high fashion and bring those two things together. This one is if we just go went to if you think back to our um, picture of the, the fancy dress, and maybe it's not so different that fashion was going from the top down and also from the bottom up, because this is a lady um, in her overalls to go to work, probably in a factory in the First World War. 
Um, somehow the illustrators managed to make it look rather sort of dainty and delicate. I'm sure this was actually a very thick and lumpy kind of garment made in some thick wool serge or some heavy cotton. But the designer somehow has managed it to make it look rather elegant. Um, but women at the time, um, and women from all classes, had, um, were called in to do war work. And for many, it was actually, I think, in particular the upper class women, it was quite a liberation um, because otherwise they were supposed to sit at home and um, have uh, hold soirees and um, just do social activities, just waiting until uh, Mr. Wright came along and they made a, um, a good marriage. So actually for a lot of women who were also interested in and took part in the suffragette movement, um, and then did war work, set up military hospitals, um, drove cars, did all sorts of things. Um, so it was actually obviously a time of um, great upheaval, but for a lot of women it also was a liberation as well. Um, this one on the other side, to come back to our uh, talking about this from a dressmaking point of view, this is a McCall's pattern and the McCall's company um, was quite established by this time. There were quite a few uh, pattern companies making patterns for home dressmakers. Um, you could buy sewing machines, they were very expensive. Um, my, my own grandmother, who certainly was, was a very working class woman, she worked in a, a factory making clothes, but she had a, a sewing machine with, I had, I started sewing with it and I had the 1927 um, uh, uh, guarantee in it and the tin box with all the bits and pieces. And I, it was a wonderful sewing machine. It's probably still going somewhere. Um, but this is a McCall's pattern for um, a, a surgeon's gown for a military hospital. Um, so this is a bit reminiscent of today and people making um, scrubs and making uh, PPE today. So it's something, uh, nothing changes. Um, but just in the um, paper, pattern industry at the time. Um, the people in America and in the UK, they were promoting that women um, made their own clothes, but the original patterns were all cut by hand and the markings were punched in, so they probably weren't necessarily that accurate. Um, and just about this time, the McCall uh, company um, patented or invented and patented the idea of actually printing onto the tissue paper, which meant that they could print the patterns in far greater volume and with far greater accuracy. Um, and um, they, they actually had the patent on this for quite a long time. So it has enabled them to uh, leap ahead of all the other um, pattern making um, companies. So this one is a Canadian sewing pattern and it's still keeping that same kind of silhouette. So it's kind of coming in at the bottom with some draping, like a sort of tulip skirt. We would call a tulip skirt, but a, a longer one. Obviously, there's only so many ways you can cut a piece of cloth and this shape, I think you might recognize from 1980s clothes to have a narrow, at, at this time, at the knee or above. So the same kind of shape. Um, but this has been simplified for um, home sewers to make and obviously by this time was considered um, kind of mainstream enough that it could be released as a pattern for um, misses anyone to wear but I think for the home sewer it must have been an absolute godsend to make um, these nice simple shapes obviously they're much more one size fits all you don't have to be so precise with the the cutting and the fitting um, so after all those frilly, fussy um, Edwardian uh, clothes, this must have been just an absolute boon to the uh, to the home dressmaker. This one is a cartoon, and men caricaturists have always loved to men cartoonists to caricature women, um, and obviously the fashion fashion is always a, a great. Uh, always ready for a dig and this one is no exception so here's a lady in her extreme harem trousers and uh, also and her great big kind of Edwardian hat so she's looking um, I think she's looking rather dashing actually but the cartoonist probably thought that she looked a bit silly and you'll have to make your own mind up about whether you think it's an attractive look or not. This is a kind of hybrid style because she's still got as you say this Edwardian um, hat and yeah. uh, bodice um, and then she's still got this very uh, sculpted waist and hips but they're these big billowing trousers. Do you think um, this little man in the background is actually meant to be Poiret because he was quite a stout little fellow? 
Could be. It really is him. I think it might be him. It's true, actually. There's that amazing picture of him wearing a coat with all his models. Yeah. Looking exactly like that. He was very um, avant-garde. I think the cartoonists were just jealous. He was very avant-garde and he used to go about with a whole um, bevy of women all dressed up in his latest style. So I think mm. maybe the cartoonists were just a bit, um, a bit jealous of him, really. So that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of the fashion moment in 1920 and the influence that Poiret uh, had. Um, and then we're going back to return to these lovely illustrations because these really informed what we decided to do for the practical part of this project. Uh, and that was to focus on the trouser design and how to make up a very simple trouser block um is that what you want to call it a block yes i think it's a block that you could then use for all yeah. kinds of develop into different styles um okay so do i need to say that again then okay yes go on So now we've done a um, whistle stop and slightly random tour of uh, Poiret and the 1920s fashion moment. Um, we are going to move on to the practical section and what we decided to focus on actually with this harem girl um, looking at us is the trouser um, and how to make a trouser block with this very voluminous uh, wide leg shape in mind which is all of course based on rectangles and draping. So we're going to go back to these uh, lovely illustrations as these really served as our main inspiration for what we're going to show you next. And if we go through, this is what we made. Um, so Alice made a pair of trousers and I turned mine into a little jumpsuit. But I think we'll stop that there and move on to the practical part. So now we've moved over into my pattern cutting software and I'm going to show you how I've created a block from which you can then use to design your own pair of quarry inspired trousers or a jumpsuit. Um, so first of all, just another quick look, a refresher look at the pictures. And I've really based, based on really these, these two, I think is probably the closest. So you can see as we go through. Um, this is what we're going to make, this is what it's going to look like. So if you have a go at making your something yourself, it'll look something like this. So you can see it really is a simple, it's a rectangle here. If you imagine that's half a skirt, so this is the centre front and this is the centre back. So you could make a big tube there and take it in at the waist with some gathering or some darts or pleats and that would be a long skirt. So by adding on these two pieces, um, that with kind of hooks at the top, which are the pieces that go through the legs. We've turned the, the one piece tube into the two, the two legged tube, which is really the basis of all trousers. Modern designs, because they are much smaller around the crotch area, well, you'll see they don't have a straight line across the top because in order to make this line shorter, you have to make this line longer. Um, so if you look at this compared to bare modern trousers, it'll look quite different. But if you look at a culottes pattern, it'll look something like this. So that's what we're, um, that was my beginning point. That's what I made first. And in order to get to that, these are the measurements that I took. And I'm a kind of size 10, so I base this on my measurements, but obviously you can replace with your own. So um, I started off with the hip measurement, this is all really based on the hip because it's the only place it really has to fit. So, and I added 10 centimeters of ease by putting my tape measure around me and kind of wriggling around with an extra 10 centimeters. That felt about right to me, but you could use a bit more or a bit less because the whole point of cutting your own patterns is to have exactly what you want. So here's my maths, 96 centimeters plus 10. So this is the hip measurement that I'm going to use, 106 centimeters. And then I'm going to need some divisions by two, by four and by eight. So I made all those numbers first. And then I took the crotch length. And if you've never measured that on yourself, if you sit on a flat surface like a hard chair or a table or a bench, 
and then you measure from your natural waistline just down the side. And then I added three centimeters to give me the kind of hang of the crotch that I wanted. So um, you could add more, you could add less, um, but this is kind of a good starting point to get this kind of foray kind of trouser look. Um, and then the waist to the floor was just how long that I wanted to make my, my block. And then what I'm going to show you is step by step um, how I created this. And we will have some resources at the end. So if you'd like to try this for yourself, I'm going to send you a copy of this picture that's got all the measurements on and you can have a go. It's actually a nice simple piece of pattern cutting. So I started uh, with the length, so just the, with 102 centimeters, the um, waist to floor length. And then because I'm making half of this, it's symmetrical. It doesn't have a side seam, this pattern. You could chop it in half later and add one if you wanted, but it doesn't for the moment. So I'm making one half, so it's a front leg, and it's actually the back leg is this side and the front leg of this side stuck together. So I'm using half my measurement and then to complete the rectangle. So there's my box. So were I to make it now, it would just be a kind of slightly loose gathered skirt. So I'm gonna make a halfway point, which is the side seam. And you could split this and make a side seam if you wanted to make it maybe wider at the bottom or more tapered at the bottom. So, or you can leave it all as one, less sewing, which is always good in my book. Um, so then I added some, lines across some horizontal lines. I added a line at 17 centimeters, which is um, not the hip at the widest point, which is really more the bottom. It's like the hip bone kind of measurement. And then I added my crotch depth plus three centimeters, which is the 28. And now I need, I've got all the, the basic structure now. So now I need to add my hooks so I can go between the legs. So I started off with my back extension and the back extension is um, one eighth of the hip measurement. So if I go back up to my mass here, it does help to have put, made all these measurements um, before you start. So you've just got them to read off. So this was divided by 106 divided by eight, which comes to 13.25. Whoever would have known mass could be so useful. So here's my back extension here. And then I'm going to square down. So again, in a more modern pair of trousers, you would have more of a curved line in here. To, to get this very wide, straight kind of look, we're just going to take straight down here. And then I'm going to complete my back crotch line. So I'm going to go straight down to the hip bone level and then I'm going to make a nice kind of curve here. You could do that with a with a saucer. I think if you haven't got, um, if you've got a fancy French curve, you could use that. You can just eyeball it or, or a bendy ruler um, or yeah, a plate or a saucer. You can, a mug, something that fits nicely into that shape. And then this line is about the same as this. And then you can just carry on to the edge. So that will give you the back extension. Again, this differs from modern trouser patterns because in a modern trouser pattern, this line will be further over to account for the slope of the back. So you get more of a line that kind of came up like this. So this is very much giving you this divided skirt kind of look. Um, all started off with um, a lady called Amelia Bloomer, who wanted women to be freed from corsets and also to wear, she's very keen on cycli cycling and she wanted, um, obviously you could, you could ride a horse side saddle, but you couldn't cy cycle side saddle, so there had to be a divided skirt and this is another kind of inspiration I think for the Poiré trousers. So there were several things happening at the same time, some of it to do with ideas of women's health and women being able to participate in um, active sport and some of it to do with fashion. Um, but I diverse. So to come over to my front extension, this is a one eighth of the hip measurement minus two centimeters. I don't know if I said on this one, it's one eighth of the hip measurement plus two centimeters, um, but it's all on the uh, crib sheet. So if you want to go, everything's written down there. And then once again, we can square down 
and then complete the front crotch line. This one, the hook's a little bit shorter, so this should probably be about equal in both directions. And then just carry on up to the waist. And this really is a nice quick pattern to do. You can just complete your waistline across. And then if we come down to the bottom, um, you can complete the hemline and you're done. So that is the shape to give you a Poiret inspired wide leg trouser. So once we've got to that point, Lilia, do you want to add anything in there? No, I think it's just, it's striking how it really is just a skirt with two little bits to join in them in between the legs. Um, so it's, it's nice. I think trousers often seem very daunting um, from a pattern cutting perspective because they're, 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 they are a complicated shape to fit if you're trying to fit them very snug to the body. Um, but this makes it seem a lot more accessible, I would say. And if you've ever made a pair of trousers, it's quite interesting to look at a modern trouser pattern compared to this shape. Actually, I think it's only relatively recently, even from like the mid 80s, that trousers have got so tight around the top. Um, I think otherwise, maybe in Hollywood, but actually trousers, the, if you take trouser blocks or trouser patterns from older pattern cutting books, they do tend to be much looser. It's only really with the advent of stretchy fabrics that we've been able to get them so tightly fitting around the body. And that that's been acceptable actually to wear such tight fitting clothes for men and women. Yeah. So um, what I wanted to show you next was just a couple of different things you could do. So looking at, um, at the harem pants that Lilia, some, that, uh, some of the patterns that Lilia showed you, some of the designs there, they're actually much wider at the bottom than they are at the top. So the rectangle then begins to be a section of a circle. Um, so in order to do that, if you um, cut the pattern up through that side line, which is this dotted line on the pattern, and then cut again, halfway through, um, make a, a mark halfway from the side to the center back and make a vertical line and again to the front and make another vertical line and then chop the pattern up and spread it apart. You can see you begin to get part of a circle then and you can really keep on spreading. If you keep on opening and opening, it's like opening a fan, you would eventually come to half a circle and then you would need to obviously curve off the waistline and curve off the hem. And once you've got that very circular kind of shape, then you can gather it back at the bottom and turn it into a cuff and you've got trouser with even more volume in. So it's quite fun to have a go, have an experiment with these shapes. Um, you could always try them out on a small scale as well, just to see how they looked before you committed to a large piece of material. But if you've um, if you haven't if you've got any old um, bed sheets or duvet covers left that you haven't used as twirling during lockdown, I think this would be a great um, a great use for them to have a go at making some of these things. Um, obviously, here you could also extend this up above the waist, and then you could use that as the basis for a top like Lilia's um, dungaree shaped ones. Uh, Lilia, have you got anything you want to? Chuck into the mix there. I don't think, I think, well, I guess this is to show you a, um, a kind of transitional pattern between just using completely flat draped method of making trousers. Cause we did also talk about um, the, the, the alternative to this is to just literally use a length of fabric folded back up with holes in the bottom, essentially for your feet to go through. So it's not a pair of trousers, in the conventional sense, it's more like a skirt with holes in. There's two, a couple of ways of drawing those. I could draw you one right here and now. Um, with this, it's like based on um, a Thai fisherman's kind of trouser. And I'm sure lots of people have come back from holidays with this kind of thing. So you basically make a big triangle and chop off the top here. And you can make some little, so this is a fold here and you can chop off the ankles and either just keep them like that or you can add some little um, cuffs at the ankle. And then this shape will give you a trouser that's got lots of drape between the legs 
very like some of those designs from the Basque um, theatre costumes. So you could make a shape like that, which will then, well, obviously when you put your feet together will drape through the bottom. Mm -hmm. And there was another one that was even more simple uh, that I think you showed me, um, we talked about from the VNA, where you make a loop of fabric like this. Yeah. So the fabric slips it simply looped between the legs. Let's see if I can make that look more like a loop. There we go. It's looped there. And then once again, you can either, you could have your feet, it's going to be a very funny drawing of a foot, but you could have your foot, doesn't look anything like a foot. Um, you could have your foot coming out here, or you could cut a hole in the bottom. Yeah, I mounted for the Ocean Liners exhibition a pair of trousers that were cut exactly like this. Um, and But they were actually, um, they had some extra darts in the side seam. So they were stitched down the two lengths of the fold to where the feet are, um, like the one on the left. And then they had some little darts put in so that it kind of fanned out a bit. And oh, then they also had little beads, so to give it a bit of weight because it was a very fine silk and then they're just gathered onto a um, grey grain ribbon at the top as a waistband. So you would then get something like this with some little buttons. We can have some little buttons here. There we go. And you could make some night that would give you a little bit more three dimension mm. dimensions to them because you could get some then some nice little tucks kind of coming across. And I think really this method was used for all sorts of things. So you could make a cloak in very much the same way. Or if you tip the whole thing upside down, then you'd have like a tunic kind of top that you could make very much in the same way. So the idea of it's really a way of showing off beautiful fabrics. And there were some sumptuous uh, fabrics with kind of what's with jazzy type prints on abstract prints. And um, there's a designer called Sonia Delaunay who was very, um, made a more sort of Russian constructivist look out of these things with big, bold paintings. So this kind of fab, this kind of textiles lend themselves very much to um, simple shapes because you, you're wearing a painting. So should we go back and have a look at uh, the details of the ones that we made ourselves? Okay, yeah, so I've got a little um, slideshow to show you of, um how I made up the trouser block. So I started with raiding my stash um, and I found this lovely uh, silk um, fabric, which I think is a sari and it has one section has this border print um, and then the rest of it has this nice uh, flower design. Um, I thought that orange was a nice nod to the lovely quarry illustrations we were looking at before. Um, so this was the section that I had, which was the border print. So I was folded that in half double and then I put my trouser block piece, which I drew out from the measurements which we've just gone through um, and you will be able to download. Um, and you can see it just fits on my border print. So I was very pleased about that. I had to make it a couple of centimetres short at the bottom, but that's okay. Um, and then the next step is to cut that out, remembering to add my seam allowances as I cut. So these are my two trouser leg pieces and I've just joined them along the inside leg seams. Um, and one of them is the right way out and one of them is the wrong way out. And then I'm just gonna put one inside the other um, and stitch up the crotch seam. So a very quick and easy standard trouser construction with just two pieces. So they come together very quickly. And then if I show you this picture, this is my first try uh, on of my trousers. And you can see I'm looking a bit like one of those before and after weight loss pictures. Um, but of course, this is actually the design of the trouser in this example. So I wanted them to be this big. And then the game now is to um, imagine yourself in Poiré shoes and draping these pieces uh, of how to organize that excess fabric into um, a nice design. So I had a go um, and this, is, this would be the simplest option 
So I could have just gathered them at the waist and onto an elastic waistband, probably. So a nice wide elastic would be nice or um, turned under and a, a simple elastic through there. Um, other options would be to uh, add some kind of tucks or darts at the front and the back waist. So this is playing around with that idea. Um, then I thought about doing two tucks as well, um, a very kind of high waisted trouser. Um, I think you played this game as well, Mum. I did absolutely the same. I got my pins out and I put pleats this way, that way. I wore a big piece of elastic. I went around with a big piece of elastic with it folded over for an hour, trying to see if I wanted to go down that route. Actually, this was quite a good um, tip, I realised. So I was wearing this body to try them on and then I could pin in to the, pin them into myself. So oh, that's kind a of good idea. myself like a mannequin. Um, like a pin cushion. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then what I actually decided to go for in the end was to invent a kind of um, Poiret workwear hybrid design. Um, so I this is just fashioned out of some scraps of fabric as I was playing around um, and I made this little bib piece and then I decided to that I would go for this and make them into a kind of pair of dungarees. So um, I just uh, made a little design for myself so I knew what pieces I needed um, and uh, ma marked out the dimensions for the bib piece. Um, and then I was a good pattern cutter and I made a pattern piece for that as well. Um, as I'm, this fabric is silk and quite slippy, it helps to control it to have something to um, cut around. But as it's such a simple piece, I could also have just cut this straight onto the fabric. Um, and then these are my straps, which I made of some of the selvage because I wasn't sure if I might want the, the white edge. I went for the orange in the end, um, but that served quite nicely for the straps. Um, and then this is putting together the bib. So I just cut the bib um, uh, in two pieces, identical pieces, and then sandwiched the straps in between um, those two bib pieces. And then I could sew all the way around the edges of the bib there. And then it looks something like that, which um, looks like quite a cute little handbag at this stage. I might have to make myself a mat matching one for the finished outfit. Um, and then I pinned it all together. So you can see I was getting quite pleased with how this was uh, turning out, but I still had the problem of what to do with the excess fabric, especially around the back. So my solution to that was, um, that is a kind of mock-up where I would, uh, add some pleats into the front waist um, and then kind of fold the sides in so that I would get this nice draped effect um, where the bib meets the trousers um, and then it would just stay uh, nice and smooth and flat at the back. So this is a picture so you can see the way that I achieved this is to sew the dart in or the, or the tuck rather uh, when I attach the bib and then I added two little buttons, that's a better picture of it there, um, and a little rouleau loop onto the edge of the fabric, which means that I just fold that section around um, and then you get these nice um, kind of uh, open folds at the front of the trouser leg. So it ends up looking something like that, um, which I think uh, feels still quite true to the great style of Poiré, um, but also makes it quite um, modern and young and fun and there's a kind of lightness to the garment as well. I think it's 1920s, 1970s, 2020s. It uh, <laughs> <laughs> spans many decades outfit. It looks great, Lilia, well done. So Lilia, I think yours turned out really well. We did have a little, I know, a little uh, online design session in the middle where we discussed all the uh, merits of pleats going this way and that way. Um, and I think it, they came out really well. And so do you want to just show the details of them? Let's have a little online fashion show now. Yeah, I mean, they feel lovely to wear. I think if I go this way, you can see me. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Yeah, so I mean, I've been wearing them all day since I made them and they feel very nice and swishy. 
Um, I love the fact that from the side, it looks like you're wearing a dress um, and you can do loads of cool, like... <laughs> looks like models. you've got some fans in the background as well <laughs> on your dressing table, on your chest. Oh yeah, I have. Yeah. Poirier accessory there. Um, and then this is the this is the way I did it up in the end. So as you said, I'll do anything to avoid putting a zip in. Um, um, so I just put a little loop in the middle of this um, excess fabric that I have here, and I'll add a little button, and then that just creates an extra fold, which I um, did. Put is that just self? above the exist the fold I stitched in? Is that your selvage of your fabric at the top, or did you have to make a hem at the top? No, that's just the selvage of the fabric. That's very nice. I think Poirot would have approved of that. Always use yeah. the edge of the fabric where you can. So I think that that's quite, um, quite nifty. I think they look great. Yeah. I did think about doing a crossover back as well, with another option. Yeah, so do you want to show us yours? Yes, mine are a bit more structured. Um, and they, I did the same thing as you, exactly the same that I had my trousers held out here thinking, now what on earth am I going to do with this? And I tried all sorts of things. I did go around for an hour or two with a piece of a big wide piece of elastic folded over at the top. Yeah. And then I decided um, maybe I would do, if you can see my back, I decided maybe like a little waistcoat buckle at the back, but then mm -hmm. I put a, a center back zip in. So I decided that was really going to be a nuisance to undo every time I wanted to go to the loo. So I abandoned that idea. Um, and I made in the end a dart in the back because my fabric's a bit stiffer than yours and I didn't want it puffing out at the back as well as mm -hmm. the front. And I thought I'd drown in all that fabric. So I ended up um, making a pleat at the front. Well, this seems very odd because it's, a, it's um, in working in reverse, it's hard to see what you're doing. So did you do like a box pleat? I made a stitch, that, no, just made a, no. a single pleat but folded into the middle. Okay. So I did one on the other side and then I made two ties and one I um, stitched onto the um, seam there and the other one is stitched on Stitched into the dart, you mean? Into the dart, yes, on this side. So I've got a kind of asymmetric tie. So it comes from the um, the right back round to the left side. So I made a, yeah. little, a shorter tie and I stitched all that together. And then I thought it just somehow needed something else. So I decided to finish it off with some of those uh, decorative stitches on the sewing machine. So I did a kind of, I don't know if you can see that, I did a kind of... Uh, a twirly stitch there in grey mm -hmm. and then I like very much these kind of um, satin stitch um, what would you call it? circles so I use those quite a lot to finish on my clothes so become a bit of a trademark so I did some circles down there and then I did some circles around there and then I thought that was really fun so where else could I put the circles? <laughs> I did some circles on that one down the back to hold it all down. Yeah. Um, and then I decided to just finish off my hem by using my, um, again, my sort of squiggle stitch mm. with the hem, which again gives it a bit more of a girly finish. Um, and I wasn't going to hem those big wide hems by hand, and I didn't just want a kind of boring machine stitch. So that seemed a nice solution. And like you, I've been wearing these all day, and I'm imagining... Um, a lovely, like a wool crepe version with a nice crepe for winter. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking maybe some, what about some silk velvet ones to wear at Christmas? Or um, that would be really cool. So um, I'm going to have another rumble in my stash and see what else I can find to make another pair. Yeah, I was definitely dreaming about a velvet pair as well. I think that would be really nice. Well, hopefully people that have watched this video might make some um, themselves and then we'll get to see some different versions as well. Great, yes. Is there going to be a somewhere from this weekend to upload um, designs? I'm sure there will be. Yeah, so there'll be um, a hashtag or if you hashtag Alison Co Patterns on Instagram then we'll find you or email us um, and show us your designs. We love seeing what people make. Okay, so I think we survived just about our um, first pre-recorded um, Zoom lesson. 
pattern cutting lesson. Um, I guess the final thing to say is that if you do want to follow through and make your own Poirier inspired trousers, there'll be a download on our website, so alisonkopatterns.com, um, with uh, all the information that you need um, and the diagram of how to draft out your own um, pattern to your own measurements. Um, and if you enjoyed this um, talk, uh, you might be interested in one of our online pattern cutting classes, which um, the next dates are next weekend. Um, and we're not actually sure when we're going to be able to do them again after that, as I'm probably going to have to go back to work soon. Um, so if you are interested, we have a t-shirt, a jumpsuit, um, a different, more modern um, style of trouser, um, a bit more fitted. Um, and also a smock class all happening next weekend. Um, so do check those out on the website as well and you can sign up. Um, do we have anything else, any other news we need to share? Um, well, if people are interested in the pattern cutting system that I use, which is um, called Telestia, which is if you want to do the opposite and make really nicely fitted patterns, um, including dots and very three, three dimensional shaping. Um, again, we've got some um, information about that on the website or else uh, contact us via the website and I can give you some more information about that. And yeah. we have a book as well. And that's oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, if you, uh, we've whet your pattern cutting appetite, um, <laughs> there's a link on our website to um, buy our book, which is um, pattern cutting for skirts and dresses. So not trousers yet, but maybe one day. Um, and if you've liked this talk and the kind of historical aspect of it, it is something um, that, well, I would like to do again. Mum, would you? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Let us know what areas you'd like to, you'd like to know about. Yeah, well, I actually, when my um, researching Poirot before we did it, I found out that he um, was an early champion of Schiaparelli. Okay, that could I be something. I thought we might have to do Schiaparelli next, or yeah. Scaparelli. Yeah. How do you say it? Okay, well, we'll let everyone get back to their sewing. We um, hope you have enjoyed this. Um, and yes, do get in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye.